No pressure at all on many levels. Excellent. Um, so hello, everyone. I'm John Garbett. Um, I'm from Stack HPC. So share a little bit of my journey to this stage today. Um, so I started off, I graduated in 2006 and started doing closed source software at Citrix. Um, started dabbling with Zen server and virtualization and things. And about uh, late 2010, I heard about this exciting thing called cloud. Didn't know what it was. Ended up moving into sort of working on OpenStack and all that kind of thing. And I sort of went through that journey of being the newcomer in, and being sort of privileged to have mentors nudging me, going, no, 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 you should speak up, you should say that, and go through that process. And I eventually sort of became uh, the Nova project technical lead um, when I moved from Citrix to Rackspace at the public cloud there, and, did, uh, and sort of took up some leadership roles within the community and really enjoyed that and embraced that. And since um, the summer of 2017, I've been at Stack HPC and doing cloud, doing um, sort of similar kind of things, but more science-y. So one of my first contracts I was working on there for Cambridge, working with Cambridge University at a contract, we were helping um, consult with the square kilometer array. And so that brings you to this talk today, um, which hopefully is not just an excuse for very pretty pictures, because they're excellently pretty. So um, I should probably start with what on earth is the SKA? I'll get to that Loki bit in a minute. Um, so first of all, this is an artist's representation that's sort of zooming across. Um, so it's a, the idea of the square kilometer array is, to, is a telescope. In fact, it's two telescopes. You've got one on the left here. Um, I'm probably standing just in front of a little tiny truck down here to sort of give you a sense of scale about how big that is. Hopefully some of you can see it. Here I do that. <laughs> Excellent. I didn't know I was going to dance. Sorry, that wasn't intentional. Um, anyway, so we've got this. Um, SK mid over here, they look like massive satellite dishes. Um, well, they are, basically. And then you can probably sort of see a very rough colored thing here. I'll do a zoom in in a second. Basically, lots of metal Christmas trees. Uh, as you can tell, I'm more on the computing side of this rather than the telescope side of this. Um, but hopefully, that's OK for the people in the audience. I know there's some people in the audience with physics PhDs, and so they'll get annoyed with me. That's fine. Anyway, sorry. Um, so on the far, far side, we've actually got the SKA headquarters. Um, if you're watching, that's the thing that I zoomed past. I couldn't decide which side to crop. But that's in the UK, so that's at Jodrell Bank. And it's a big um, international collaboration. And really, oh, I probably need to do something there. No more aligning work today. <laughs> um, so um, what we've got here um, is a telescope, and what the in general, with many telescopes, if you've been listening to the news, um, what's helped me a lot for this talk is you may have heard about the James Webb Telescope and the amazing pictures it's been doing. And you get the Hubble versus James Webb. And basically, the more sensitive and the lower wavelengths, the further back in time you can go. So it's a bit like a time machine, really. You just look at the light that's been traveling for millions of years towards Earth. So the Square Kilometer Array is trying to go back even further, basically, very, very far back and look at the cosmic dawn. And there's all sorts of interesting signals where like, electrons move between bits of hydrogen. You can, they emit radio waves that then redshift, and then you can pick them up. I have no clue about all that. But it's cool. They create pretty pictures. <laughs> so um, first of all, let's talk about these two telescopes. I'm just checking the time. Wow. Whoops. Um, so on the left-hand side, we've got the mid thing. These are the metal Christmas trees I was talking about. I almost snagged my jump on one of these because there's one outside a meeting room in Cambridge. But anyway, um, so they're quite they're about this high for sort of scale. And then you've got those big dishes over there where sort of a car comes to sort of the bottom of the hump on the bottom of that sort of spine. So this is a huge engineering project. So some stats just to sort of give you a scale. Um, this, the metal Christmas trees are in Australia, SK Low. Yeah, woo! <laughs> It is a truly international collaboration. Um, and that's about 50 to 250 megahertz. And really, it's about being more sensitive. So this telescope's more sensitive and can scan the sky faster to, get, to look more, you know, to go further back in time. And this is a huge sort of civil engineering project. You know, there's 130 of these antennas in a very particular places across the desert. And to give you a scale of this thing, um, 
for the, you know, they're both spread out, so there's like 74 kilometers between these things. So I came down from Cambridge today, that's about, I checked, it's about 100 kilometers. So yeah, from here to Cambridge, sort of full of these things. Um, they're having to move villages and things to actually make this possible, because you have to have radio silence within this area to actually be able to pick anything up. So anyway, you've got, and if you look at the South African one, um, so we've got South Africa telescope as well. That's uh, 97 dishes, even further spread apart, 150 kilometers. This thing's a huge thing. So let's try to get a bit more into the computing side of this. Underneath the ground, there's lots of fiber optics and signal processors. And eventually, you get about 8 terabits a second of data coming in. And that's from each telescope. So the Australian one and the South African one both have about 8 terabits of data. The idea is that this is meant to be about a 50-year lifespan they're planning for and 24-7 operations. So that's quite a lot of raw data by any measure. Granted, this felt like a lot more data when I first started working on this about five, six years ago. <laughs> but still, it's still a lot of data. Um, I like to claim this as a sort of edge computing case because we need to, data, we need to reduce that data at the, the edge. just happens that we need one of the we need basically a big supercomputer to do that, to do all the FFTs to get that into an image. So for scale, 130 petaflops that they're thinking about here, uh, that would easily get you in the top 10 supercomputers in the world right now. Um, I think I checked, it was, you, this would be sort of six and seven, depending on who won. Probably the one that got more cold air. Anyway, um, so yeah, two supercomputers. From that, we get only um, a petabyte a day from each of the telescopes. So we haven't actually done the science bit yet. This is getting the data. Well, I suppose yeah, there's a lot of science going on here. Don't get me wrong. Um, but we've got those signals coming in. We've reduced them down to the artifacts that the scientists can work on. Then that needs to be globally distributed to where the computers will live um, across the globe to try and actually do the science on this and process that data, analyze that data. Um, so there, you know, that globally means there's about 700 petabytes a year over that 50-year lifespan getting distributed across the globe. This model I'm talking about, for those of you that have heard sort of talks on CERN and the WOCG, will go, well, that sounds very familiar. Um, that's because it's a very, it's, this cl global collaboration is modeled on the same thing. Um, CERN are going to have high luminosity, which they start to get the same similar data rates to, within about the same time of time frame, so it's sort of a joint, there's a lot of joint efforts on how this happens. But yeah, trying to get all that data around. From a science usability perspective, so the, the radio astronomer that is submitted to the telescope, the telescope has taken their observations, they need to actually get some work done. They're very much used to downloading the data onto their laptop and having a poke about of it in the notebook and you know doing that kind of analysis. Um, we've just broken that because these data sets are about 200 terabytes. And we just can't sustain people downloading that all the time. So we need to get more of a, you know, and people, are, even with the people with the larger data sets, are used to, well, I'll just download it to my local supercomputer. That sounds ridiculous, but that is a thing um, uh, <laughs> for scientists at universities that have supercomputers. But again, that's not, it means that you actually have to have the resource and it's kind of a, a barrier to entry, right, in order to actually do that processing. So we need to get to the point where you can walk up and self-service these environments and deal with this data flowing through the system. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a flavor of what the Square Kilometer Array is trying to do. Um, go back in time, understand where we all came from, I guess. Um, and that's sort of the amount of data that we're looking at moving about. So what is Loki? Um, I suppose I should say, for people who thought I was going to be talking about a different type of SKA that involves baggy trousers, I apologize. Um, for people that came for the Marvel side of this, I also apologize. For the people that came for logging, I also apologize. Um, anyway, so the Loki I was talking about here is um, this open infra standard. So Linux, OpenStack, and Kubernetes infrastructure. And it's um, with sort of taking the sort of local bare metal machines and making them dynamic infrastructure that we can you know, work with and, and move about. And that's where the Loki piece comes into. But 
given everything that's happening this year and the last few years, I can't really just introduce open and not say what is open. Um, I don't think I'll do a very good job at this, but I kind of want to put something out there to try and help that conversation on how much time I've got. Not enough. So I wanted to share something from the OpenStack community. I should say this is the OpenStack community before I uh, joined the OpenStack community had set these um, milestones and aspirations of what they want to do as a community. And they're all work in progress. These are a journey that we're always trying to get better at. In the previous talk, I've still got loads of really interesting ideas in my head about how we do better at a lot of these things. But open source, it's Apache. Open design um, is that the community comes together and design it. It's not like a little explicitly trying not to be a tiny little clique that designs these things and being open to new ideas and doing that open development. An open development meaning that every patch set should be considered, you know, every patch set, every contributor should be considered equally. Um, this is hard. This is really hard. But this is the aspiration. And that open community. So OpenStack particularly says users and the developers and the ecosystem all together, having that conversation together about what the design should be, what, how to develop, and evolving this together. And it's, for me, it's been a really rewarding journey to, you know, trying to meet these goals. It's a ever-evolving journey, but it's been an interesting journey. And this has always been to fight. Um, at the beginning, OpenStack was actually founded by multiple companies coming together. It wasn't a single vendor thing pushed out into the open. Um, and that did slow it down, but it made it go broader. Um, it was a good quote that was previously said about this week. Um, I'm sure there was something important there. Anyway, it'll come back to me. Um, so I didn't really sort this is the four opens are about how how we build the thing, how it's made, rather than necessarily the output. And they were building on these four, four uh, software freedoms, um, which we shouldn't forget, and was kind of encapsulated in that small you know, open source bit um, that I was talking about before. You know, the freedom to run the program as you wish for any purpose, which is still important. It's interesting, that was the zeroth, which was an assumption that was originally forgotten, forgotten to be written down and was later added. Um, always like four things numbered from zero not just because it confuses my toddlers. Um, so I wanted to share, what does this process feel like? Um, and how can we make that easier? Yeah, I do need tea. <laughs> Turn notifications off, but clearly not very well. So um, an elephant. So someone told me this story, and it really resonated with me. Um, so. Three people find an elephant in a forest and start exploring bits of it. Someone finds the sort of the leg. Someone has a, a touch of the ear, and someone discovers the tusk, and they have a big argument about what this was. And really, what I'm trying to say here is, everyone, you know, you, you can approach this problem in multiple ways. I think we've talked. There's been lots of talks about using empathy and other things, but when we come together to have these open design discussions, what is really the focus is understanding the whole problem and trying to see more of the problem with the, getting more diverse um, opinions on that and actually starting to build for that bigger picture piece. And it's a really, really rewarding experience um, when approached the right way. I'm not saying it's easy, but I think it's a really, it's a, this sort of like, um, this old tale of three, Three blind people discovering an elephant and having a discussion about it just seems to sort of point at that problem in an interesting way. Um, and I sort of was quoting Wikipedia here in the whole humans have a tendency to sort of claim the, based on their limited experience, and you can get into problems there. But going into the community and having that openness to sort of have that conversation and discuss about that has been really, been really interesting. There's an awful lot to say on that, and I haven't got time. So it feels really bad leaving that there. The previous talk was really good. <laughs> anyway, um, back to science, right? So let's quote Newton, because that's good. Um, so 
I think open source and science have got an interesting sort of, um, very interestingly, friends. Um, and it's been a surprise to me sort of as moving to Stack HPC and discovering how much this is all um, they're working together. So a lot of science has to work on all of the previous theories and you know, it's, so you're building on lots of previous work and that is what we're doing with open source. And there's a lot of work to make open science better and reproducible science. Um, and these are really sort of feeding off each other and it's really interesting to see that happen. Anyway, that's just more of a segue then than what I was going to say. So I should probably answer the original question, which was how do we use Loki to power SK science? So let's go back to this slide and just highlight at one side, we've got these supercomputers we need to build. We need to get the data in, get some images out. And once we've got that, there's observatory data products, those things the scientists need. How do we get them to the, to the scientists in a way that they can actually you know, make progress? So the way I was going to go through this is just look at a few little projects that we've been working with and how just a sort of potted history of some of the bits that um, the SKA and open source have had an interesting sort of collaboration. So I want to start with um, the Alaska system. So this is sort of a miniature um, supercomputer SDP that we helped build at Cambridge. And there was a lot of um, work to inform the architecture of the SKA and how they can make use of existing systems like OpenStack, like Kubernetes, and try and make a better use of the existing systems out there. And just to sort of a highlight of some of that work, we just take two, two interesting um, points there. One was um, looking at how we can make supercomputers more agile, more reconfigurable. So if you use some of the original estimates for the STP, it just wasn't buildable because you had to sort of build and buy enough for sort of maximum capacity of what you were hoping to go through the system. So what we looked at doing was making a storage buffer to decouple the ingest of the data from the batch processing. And it turns out different observations have different amounts of different needs um, for, the, the, for the number crunching that has to happen afterwards, the batch processing, and different needs for the ingest as well. So you can actually size for average load across the time um, rather than trying to um, sort of be particular about you know, the maximum size that you need to do to get the, the images out. So it's proving that that was possible. So a lot of that was using OpenStack um, Ironic to, de to deploy those bare metal machines. This is quite relatively early on in 2017. So um, let's talk about when Kubernetes came into the fray here. So one of the things we were trying out Kubernetes on here through Magnum. And um, what we were doing there was we were looking at um, fast radio bursts. So one of the things that can happen is that a telescope at some side of the world says, yes, we over here have discovered this really interesting thing. So we want all the telescopes to drop what they're doing and go look at that now. And for fast radio bursts, that can be, you know, you really want to be within a second, ideally dropping everything that you're doing, rescanning the telescopes as fast as you can, and then reconfiguring that supercomputer you've just had. So it gets it's really, really, and the sooner you get there, the more likely you are to see it. And what I found was quite cool on some of these events is that you'll have a telescope on this side of the globe that spots something happening, and you wait for one of the telescopes to actually start being able to see it as it comes into its horizon point of view as the globe turns around. So it really is a sort of global collaboration being required, which is kind of cool. Anyway, so moving on from that, we started looking at federated e-infrastructure for doing that more SRC side of things. So how do we get this collaboration between all of the infrastructures? Um, this sounds like a regular cloud. This also includes building top um, 500 supercomputers on top of OpenStack. So being able to take that bare metal and being able to say, OK, so we need a Slurm job queue for this at some point. Sometimes we need to have a Kubernetes cluster doing some you know, distributed machine learning and moving those sliders about. On top of all that, we've built all these nice little bits, but the barrier of entry for the scientists is still really high. And then we've got to make sure we can press a button and get that done. And then moving that to the SK Regional Center in the UK 
sort of taking that on um, and testing all of these things together with the SKA, again, sort of informing the other side of the architecture, so from the SDP um, to informing the, the SRC to get that science done by the scientists. And this has been a massive, you know, massive effort with lots of different people pitching in and lots of different people helping out with the, that work, you know, including sort of like industry and um, academia across the UK and beyond. Okay, so I want to very quickly finish. Um, so is there something you can take away? How can you have a look at doing this? So I guess what I'd say is that, you know, you start with a set of building blocks. There's lots of, Lego makes great pictures, right? Um, so you start with a set of like open source tools or infrastructure, depending on what you're trying to look at. How do you actually get that to something looking pretty? Um, you know, all credit to OneSplash for their lovely pretty pictures. And then, you know, how do we make that usable? So we've been, you know, going through these like kind of like three steps essentially. So the first is with this Loki, with Linux, Kubernetes, OpenStack um, infrastructure, we can make that dynamic. We can make those supercomputers dynamic, and we've got to make this thing work. Small percentage differences over these large machines is a huge impact. Um, there's a talk by a colleague of mine later on. Do you look out for that? And how do we get this stuff reproducible and in the hands of the scientists um, and sort of making that self-service? And we've been doing that with Azimuth and now testing that with the SKA. So thank you very much. Hopefully that has given you some ideas and some inspiration to go look into this stuff. I've put some links towards the, um, the SKA website for more information from actual people that talk about radio astronomy. Um, or if it's just me, what I do like doing is watching when it next comes up on the sky of night for some of the projects we've been working with, because that's also awesome. But thank you very much for your time. It's really great. <laughs>